Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. You can be seated this morning. The lights will be on here someday. And... Uh, those of you watching me, you may see all the light on this side of me because I've got no spotlights on my... How does my hair look? Does that make my hair look better or bad? Good news! We are going to start the new year with a fast. Hallelujah! <laughs> uh, not quite as exciting as the uh, future government where we're all wealthy, huh? But we are going to do a 21-day Daniel fast. And the guys are going to put up on the screen for you right now a, a link. We'll tell you more about this as the week goes on. But we're going to follow this guy's recommendations. This is Dr. Axe. And you can see the website is draxe.com. Now listen, I know nothing about him. Zero. My daughter Casey found me this website. If it's a mess, it's all her fault. But uh, I love what he's got outlined there for you on this particular part of the website, you notice it's got slash Daniel fast. He lists all the foods that are acceptable. Don't you love a fast where you can still eat? Now, I'm so glad you guys in this section came in because when I was doing announcements and I just automatically scanned the room and I kept going over and I know people were here were saying, what's he looking at over there? Because there was nobody. Glad you're here. Um, so we're going to follow the recommendations here on what you can have. More importantly, all the things you cannot have. And some people summarize it by saying, no meats, sweets, or treats. I found out, Sister Pam and I just found out last night that we can't even drink coffee. Not even black coffee. So this is going to be a really tough fast. But it's not a total fast, so 21 days, but still getting to have food. Hallelujah for that, right? Amen? It would be terrible if I got up here and said, well, I mean, it would be great. But I think that we are entering into a time when we've got to demonstrate to God how broken and desperate we are. And there's no other way to do it. And the Bible in the Old Testament, King James calls the fast the humbling of us. That's when we humble ourselves. And so we're going to start on Monday, January 4, and we're going to go through Sunday, January 24, if you want to participate. Now listen, you can join in for a week. You can join any one of those weeks, but we're going to encourage everyone to attempt the 21-day. And, and because it's no sugars and all those things, you'll actually be doing yourself a favor, right? Uh, I've never done a Daniel fast, usually for Sister Pam and I. I. I don't know if you have. We've always just done a complete fast. And for us, three days is just kind of a, a sweet spot. Once in a great while, we'll do a seven-day, but... Uh, this is something we both feel very directed to do, and we want you to feel the same way. And so you can write that down. We'll be posting it on the website of the church this week and the Facebook page. But I tell you today, so that you can go home and eat everything in your house, everything that you've been stockpiling for the uh, pandemic to be locked in, you've got to eat it all this week, okay? Yeah, truckloads. You're just going to be in there gorging yourself. No, you don't have to do that. Keep things frozen. It's just 21 days, not 21 years. And you'll be fine. I got a gift yesterday, or Friday. The greatest gift of all gifts. I, um, I, I do more walking now out in the park than I've done in the past. And so I'm out, I try to be out there like twice a week. And sometimes I can walk out there when it's snowy and I can't walk in town. And so I said, Thursday night, I'm going to go to the park Friday morning before you guys are up and I'm going to walk. But when I go to the park, I have to wait until daylight. So it's a little later for me. And, 
And Sister Pam said, no, just, just walk here and then walk, walk at the park tomorrow, Saturday. I said, oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I was up really early Christmas morning and walked and did my walk in the city and was back. And um, I opened my gift and it was walking sticks. Like pro. I don't know if you, I've passed people with them out in the park before walking. And they've got these high performance fake sticks. They're man-made. And so I always very snobbishly always say, well, what city walkers, you know? They come from the city and they got to have the right vest on and the right shoes. And, they're, and ah, that's not walking, that's out here performing, you know? And they get the nice hat on, they got these sticks. And they're like, like it's a trail, it's all pa- almost paved, you know? And, they got, and then yesterday I was out here, look at me, I got sticks, I got walking sticks, hallelujah, they're the best ever. And I just had a great, great time. Today I walked in the city and nearly froze to death like you. But the Lord is with us. Amen. What comes after Christmas? Sister Pam said New Year's yesterday. Well, that's true. But (laughs) biblically, we get so uh, focused on Christmas, hallelujah, that I think we forget the story doesn't end in the manger. The story doesn't end with the dedication in the temple. So go in your Bible to Matthew chapter 2 today. Matthew chapter 2. And uh, look with me in verse 13. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. We um, we fall in love with Mary and Joseph as the story unfolds. Matthew really focuses on Joseph, and Luke focuses on on Mary. But uh, the two of them together create this incredible dynamic, and Joseph is led over and over by dreams, and that... Many scholars will tell you that that's a a reference back to the Old Testament patriarchs who again and again had visions and dreams of the Lord. Now this hasn't happened, as I told you last week, this 400 plus years, nothing like this is recorded as having happened in Israel. But Matthew, retelling the story years later, says that Joseph received dreams again and again. Mary, we find out, it has an angelic visitor and then is led by the Holy Spirit. Not that one is better than the other, but it's just a way of communicating with the audience, you and I, for Matthew, mostly a Jewish audience, what's taking place and how God is directing this family. And we know the timing, we don't know specific days, but we know the timing is that they're in Bethlehem for the birth, they go to Jerusalem for the dedication, and somewhere there they probably return to where they've been staying in Bethlehem or they've made other accommodations. We don't know because it doesn't matter. But what we know is that they are told by God, you've got to get out of Israel and you have to go to Egypt. Now for you and I, this is critical. And I don't just mean you and I sitting here or even just you and I watching, but I mean for every human being who has ever walked on planet Earth. If you are going to depend on a Savior and Messiah, if you're going to identify with heaven-sent King, then you have to have somebody, that person has to have been into Egypt. I don't mean necessarily the location geographically of Egypt, although that's what God chooses Egypt, biblically, is always a picture for you and I. It's always a representation of the world, the life of sin, however you want to describe it, but the life without Jesus Christ, a life of selfishness, disobedience, rebellion. It's the world. It's people of the world living in the world. And so in the Old Testament, God brought his people, his whole nation and somewhere here you'll see a footnote in the New Living, and it references back to Habakkuk, or Hosea, I think it is, Hosea 11.1, 1, which is the reference that we'll see in a moment. And so even in the Old Testament, they understood the importance of having come out of Egypt. Now, Israel, 
Jacob and his sons went into Egypt somewhat against their will. Mary and Joseph and Jesus also go into Egypt against their will. They would have never chosen to do that. And the Bible, I think, is helping us to see a picture that if you think of Jesus only and our identification with him, he goes into Egypt as a result of the choices of others. I think that's true for almost everybody, if not everybody. I'm not saying we are not responsible for our choices and our decisions. In no way am I excusing sinful actions or sinful decisions. What I'm saying is that's the nature of humanity. That's our course apart from Jesus Christ. And so the Bible shows us that he goes into Egypt so that he can identify with us. He who knew no sin. He never sinned. He never had a a thought that was anything but a suggestion by Satan. Never that he brought into his being. Never that he entertained. Not only an action, but not even a thought. So how can he identify with you and I? Because he was in Egypt. Pastor, that's, that's not, a, well, yeah, that's enough. The symbolism is all that God needs for you and I to be assured that we have a Savior and a Messiah that understands everything that we go through. And that's why Hebrews makes that point again and again. He was tempted in all points, just as we are, and yet without sin. And so the picture right here from his early life, within just months of his birth, The picture is that I brought my son out of Egypt, and if I can bring him out, I can bring you out. Hallelujah. Well, let me say, if if I brought, the Lord would say, if I brought him out, I can bring you out. Praise God. I can bring you out. The message that heaven is sending to you and I is that there is deliverance in Jesus Christ and not in any other. Jesus Christ understands what it is to be in Egypt and how valuable it is to be brought out of Egypt. So let's check it out this morning, okay? Look at the next verse, 14. That night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Number one, what comes after Christmas? a passion to be out of Egypt. We don't know what all they did there. We don't know if they moved into a rental house, an Airbnb, if they bought a house. We don't know how close to a synagogue they lived. Most likely they were near or in a Jewish community there. doesn't matter. None of that pertains to the story. What we know is they had no sooner got there, hello, then God is already telling you and I the plan is to come out. The plan is never to go into Egypt, live there, and die there. That's never God's plan for anybody. Now, for those who may end up watching this someday, and you're from Egypt, or you're Egyptian, this is a picture. It has nothing to do with physical or ethnic realities today. Nothing. The Jewish person has no advantage over us The American person has no advantage. The Egyptian person. We're all, in God's eyes, in need of grace. Amen? Just saying that because you never know. I think it's incredibly helpful for you and I to understand that the moment they, even before they get there, God is already dealing with them, creating in them the passion to want to be out of there. Hallelujah. We see it again. Again, I'm referencing the Old Testament. And when the people of Israel go down there, Jacob, you know, he's kicking and screaming. He's got one kid in bondage down there. He's already got another kid dead. And, you know, I'm talking about the one that they've held to uh, get the others to come back. And, and I mean, Joseph is out of his mind. They literally have to carry him down to Egypt because he said again and again, over my dead body. There's a, a picture That's the only way I can describe it. The significance of this to God cannot be more clear. And you and I have to see what he's showing us. I want no one who's bound. I want people who are free who then choose to be bound to me. And so the moment Joseph crosses the the boundary, 
I don't know if he had to have his shot record with him and show him that he had been vaccinated to come into Egypt. I don't know. But when, when he gets there, he's already thinking about getting out. Not only is he interested in getting out, but even Joseph says to his brothers, there will come a day when you leave this nation and when you do, you dig my bones up and take me with you. That's how profound the spiritual picture of this is. Joseph said, listen, I know it's just my, my, the remains of my body. It's not going to be nothing but bones. But when you go, the symbolism is so critical that I want you to get me. And this is 400 years later. And the Bible says, and they took Joseph with them. When we have those rare glimpses into the life of somebody who has gone far into hurtful, destructive, self-destructive sin. On those rare occasions when we have a, a deep look as they try to share with others what happened as they got, even in those instances, if they are believers, they will begin to, to help you and I recognize that they saw those early steps that they were taking towards Egypt. Now, they may not call it Egypt, but into bondage and entanglement. I've heard, well, I'm in a different position than you, so I hear more of this than you do. But they can go back 30 years, 50 years, and they can tell you what began to happen and how they made those steps. Like the border is not just an imaginary line that's a quarter of an inch wide and they just stepped over it. It's a border that's many, many months and there are steps and there are people that help get you to the border and maybe even drag you over. We find out again and again today that in many, many, many cases of those who are addicted to alcohol or abuse drugs, we find out that for many of them it's a masking attempt to overcome the pain of abuse, rejection, abandonment, deep hurts and wounds. And that's them being taken into Egypt. Jesus did not go there of his own power or even his own will. But when God is working in our lives, it's not the getting there that's his focus, it's the getting us out. And no other power can bring a person out of Egypt but the power of God's grace. There is no other. You can quit doing this, you can improve that about yourself, but you cannot come out of Egypt without the help and the power and the strength and the deliverance of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one else has broken the chains of death. And what holds you in Egypt is death. That's what holds you there. Pastor, I really didn't come to church for this kind of a message on two days after Easter, Christmas. <laughs> but it's good anyways, amen? You got to know what comes after Christmas. Praise God. Come on, get the tree down, put, put something else out in the yard, put the Easter bunny out or something. Let's... What we know is when there's a passion to be out of Egypt, God will not leave you there. That night, verse 14 says, Joseph left for Egypt. And they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken. This is the reference to Hosea 11.1. 1. I called my son out of Egypt. God doesn't say I sent my son to Egypt, but he could. But that's not the focus. The focus is before you get there, I'm calling you out. Before you, so every person, when you stand before God and you say, I, I didn't know what else to do. I was just over there and that's, that's just the way I live because that's what I was taught by everybody around me. We all did the same stuff and God's going to say to you, that's not an excuse. Because for every one of Adam's sons and daughters, he has called us out of Egypt. And there's a passion to leave. I've been around a lot of people, and they're always going to do better later today or tomorrow. They're going to do better because there's a part of them. It might be a small part, but there is a desire to leave. But the rest of them overcomes, suppresses that desire, and they aren't able to get out. Hey, I don't have a clock this morning. Praise God. I just get to go all day? Oh, hallelujah. We're on a different internet system here. It's free. I'm free today. Hallelujah. All right, here's the second thing. Look at verse 19. We're going to skip the part about them returning the uh, wise men and or, uh, 
Herod's death and all that, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the killing of the children. Verse 19, when Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. I love that new living puts an exclamation point there. Get up! If you were Joseph, would you ever say to God, can you, can somebody up there talk to me when I'm not sleeping? You know, it's hard enough to get seven hours with the family tagging along, but I sure would appreciate it if somebody talked to me once in a while when I'm not dead asleep. <laughs> How many of you appreciate that God doesn't wake you up every few nights and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you? How many of you, when you're praying to God, say, God, would you just speak to me? How many of you never think, boy, I hope he doesn't speak to me in the middle of the night? Sister Pamela saying there's so much to be thankful for. Come on, let's be thankful. God doesn't wake us up every few nights and say, yeah, I'd like to take an hour and talk to you now. You know, if you normally get up at 6, God say, I, I think I'd like to start meeting you at 4.30. You say, what? Whoa, time out. No, no, no. God, when I said meet with me, I meant like when I'm feeling good about it. You know, it's convenient. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who are trying to kill the child are dead. What comes after Christmas number two, a partner to get you out of Egypt. A partner. Number one, a passion. Number two, a partner. I don't know very many people who have come out of their Egypt without somebody who's in faith, who's red hot for Jesus, who's in tune with God, who's spirit-filled, who knows how to break the chains of demonic strongholds. Come on, church. I don't know very many people who get out of Egypt without a partner who's prayed up and ready to do battle. So I'm going to say to you this morning, church, it's time that we, we're going to enter 21 praying and fasting so that God can find partners among us for people who are in Egypt. It's enough of us saying, I wish everybody would come out of Egypt. we got to put on our battle gear and get ready to go down to Egypt and bring them out. Hallelujah. Some of you, listen, I'm not talking about you go out on the streets and you hold up a sign, you preach, the end of the world is coming. I'm talking about people in your own family, people that you know. And Isaiah 58 says that God has chosen the fast that causes us to stop ignoring our family and to begin to minister to our family. People ask me all the time, pray for my family, this cousin, that cousin, Louis, whoever, and because they're just entangled in sin. But the Bible says in Isaiah 58, when we fast, that's what God begins to talk to us about. We no longer ignore or turn away from our family. We no longer have all those little statements, well, I'm praying for you. Well, I hope this is a better year for you. But now we say, oh God, I see something spiritually and we, we allow him to take us into Egypt to bring them out. We're not going there to stay. The apostle said, be careful. that you, you, Come on, be careful that you don't end up entangled. You who are spiritual, bring them out, but you be careful, lest you also, King James, lest you also. And there's that, that too many believers today don't understand the stickiness of sin, especially when it's somebody else's sin. And, and you get there and, and you find out that you're not ready to leave Egypt like you thought you were. You got to have a, a partner. And Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about Joseph being the partner for Jesus. Isn't it interesting that we don't read much about him after this? It's my belief, and listen, you can absolutely disagree with me on this, but it's my belief that he's not alive even in the teen years, or at least not the late teen years of Jesus. We know he's not there in the ministry because the Jewish leaders name the kids uh, Jesus' half-brothers and sisters, but they don't name Joseph. They name Mary and the others. So they have this family. But at some point, as a young man, Jesus loses Joseph. I'm not a big fan of this thing that Jesus was in the carpenter shop every day and he was a carpenter. I've told you that a lot of times. I don't see evidence for that. Of all the illustrations, parables, and stories that he told about farming and fishing and all, he never once told a story about a carpenter shop. And let me tell you, there's a lot of lessons in the carpenter shop. 
also, I can't imagine after the resurrection and ascension, people sitting in their living room watching their television and saying, how do you like that TV stand? You know, just before he died for the whole world, Jesus made that for me. Yeah, I know you were healed and raised from the dead, but listen, this, this baby, huh, this is worth some money here. That, that doesn't, that's in conflict with what I see in the New Testament. But nevertheless, Joseph has an assignment from God. And that assignment is to get Jesus to Egypt and to get him back out of there. Would you not agree? This is what we read about. See, we try to make things up that aren't in the Bible while ignoring what is in the Bible. Over and over again, Luke doesn't even touch on any of this, but over and over again, Matthew sees Joseph. And and when the Bible is showing us somebody, it's giving us everything we need to know. At some point, Joseph passes away. But what we know is God used him to get his son into Egypt, and more importantly, to get him back out. He's the partner for the Lord Jesus Christ. Brings him out. The wise men have brought their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so what you can imagine is, the Bible says in both the King James and the New Living, treasure, that what they bring is treasure, gang, treasure. Not not like a couple of coins, but treasure. And so this family is able to live, even though, and I know Joseph is a carpenter. I have no doubt he's a carpenter for, for many years during those, the, the Jesus and the siblings' earliest, earliest childhood. But that treasure would have been sufficient to get them out of Egypt, get them home, and to meet the needs when Joseph passed away. Partners have an assignment from heaven. You, you may say, well, I, I want to be this or I want to be that. And I, and I understand you can look at people in ministry, not certainly not me, but people who are r- really well known and, and famous. And you say, well, if that was my life, then I, things would be so much better and easier. But God isn't in the business of taking someone else's assignment and giving it to you and I. But our assignment in him is always yes and amen. And your assignment in being a partner for other people is so life transformative, life changing, life affirming, life giving. When you see the power of the Lord Jesus Christ working through you to be a partner to someone in Egypt, what could be greater than that? Hallelujah, what could possibly measure up to that? Joseph being led, now obviously he's being led by the Holy Spirit, but it specifically says he's being led by the visits of these angels, praise God. Joseph knows exactly what to do, obey. He's not going to leave Jesus there no matter how attractive it is. Listen, this wasn't a, hey, things will be better for you for a little while down the road here. This was, if you stay, he's going to kill that child. If you stay, the entire plan of redemption is is extinguished. Not sure about you, but that sounds like a pretty big deal to me. God didn't hide Satan's desire. He said to Joseph, he is seeking, Herod, is seeking to kill the child. That's the goal. Kill this child. And then as evidence, the part we did not read this morning, when he comes to Bethlehem, he kills every child two and under. As many as a dozen or 15 children, perhaps, slaughtered in a very small village of tight families, all because he feared the threat of the king that was born. Down to Egypt, out of Egypt they come. And I want to tell you this morning, you who are watching me, entangled in addiction, entangled in sin, not sure of how to find a way out, let me tell you, you won't have 12 partners, you won't have 17 partners. Normally, it's one or two at the most that God will put in your life and in your path. All of the others are pretenders. You can go to this one or that one. You'll know. You'll absolutely know. And so many times, God's tried to hook you up with the partner, to put you in contact, in covenant with the partner that knows the 
anointing of the Holy Spirit. Instead, you've gone back to that stinking drug dealer again and again. You've gone back to that abusive man to beat the snot out of you one more time. And all because you don't want to live outside of Egypt. Egypt begins to give us our mindset. Egypt begins to tell us who we are and all that we can be. Egypt begins to tell us there's nothing else out there for us. When deep inside, deep from our soul, there's always a cry, I want to come out of Egypt. But you've got to identify the anointed partner and you've got to say, tell me the truth no matter what the cost and hold me accountable. It's a great book. I uh, would like to get this... um, young man's widow here next year to speak, if that's even possible. Fearless. Uh, My son Kyle turned me on to it seven or eight years ago. Young Navy SEAL who had come through Teen Challenge, the Assemblies of God program for deliverance from addiction. Again and again he would say to his young wife, if anything ever happens... And you can't get in touch with me for, he had a number, six hours, 10 hours, something, 12 hours. Come and find me. He struggled with his entanglement with addiction. God bless her every time she would go and get him. God kept his hand of protection on that young man until he could say, I don't want Egypt anymore. It's an incredible story of perseverance on his part and hers as well, but more importantly of God's power to keep, to never give up on his people. And I'm not saying he, there are special ones that he, he'll hold on to. I'm telling you if, you, if you want to come out of Egypt, he will provide a partner always. And I'm not talking just about Jesus or the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about a human person that God has raised up. You know who that person is, or you will find out when you begin to cry out. And that person has been anointed by God to begin to bring you onto the right path. And that path is deliverance and victory. There are not many the Lord has put in your life to help get you out. But if you'll hang on to the one that's been put there, he'll bring you out. Joseph's entire assignment in the life of Jesus may have been to be the vessel God would use to bring him out. Here's the final thing this morning. Look at uh, verse 21. So Joseph got up. I love this about Joseph. When, when the angel said, go to Egypt, the Bible says Joseph got up immediately. And then when the angel says, get out of Egypt, Joseph gets up immediately. Amen. That's obedience, right? Well, I thought maybe I'd run it by the committee of church development. I, th- I thought I would assemble a task force on transition, talk to the embassy. Here's what we read. So Joseph got up. And returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son Archelaus, yeah, that can't be good, right? He was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, and we would say again, hallelujah, then being warned again in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said he will be called a Nazarene. What comes after Christmas? Number one, a passion to be out of Egypt. Number two, a partner to get you out of Egypt. And number three, a plan to not return to Egypt. Come on. A plan to not return to Egypt. This is part of what we look to cleansing stream for here at Central Assembly. There are other programs out there. Not, when I use the word program, I'm talking about a biblical approach to coming out of Egypt and staying. There is a Celebrate Recovery, and there is Living Free. There may be others that I'm not aware of. But one of the things that God wants to do in our lives when we come out of Egypt is to put a structured plan in place so that we don't go back. Amen? No sense in going back to Egypt. Nothing good happened when we were there the first time. Nothing good's going to happen the next time. But how many of you learn in your life as a human being, don't raise your hands, just agree with mine being up on my behalf, that it's hard for us to stay out of Egypt. Nay, we often find ourselves with at least one foot kind of over the border. 
O little town of Bethlehem. Pastor, this is terrible. Why would you do this on the Sunday after Christmas? Because we always ignore what the Bible teaches happened after Christmas. Thank God for the birth of Jesus Christ. Thank God for the promise of his son. The prophets declared he would come. He came. He broke chains, set people free. He healed people, raised them from the dead. But there's symbolism in what was going on in his life. And that symbolism is critical for you and I to understand what God wants to do for his people Amen? The system of this world will let you get one arm free and then it'll put two cuffs on this arm. The system of this world will allow you to be free intellectually and bind you emotionally. The system of this world will never declare you delivered, never give you privilege of deliverance, never encourage you to be delivered. The system of this world will say, this is as good as it gets. You can hope for more money, but you can never hope to live free from all of this stuff. You can't be unentangled. You cannot have your chains broken broken, but the system of the Lord Jesus Christ says, he who the Son has made free is free indeed, hallelujah. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, lost in Egypt, entangled in bondage, down there for no good purpose, and bring us out. Glory to God. That's the message, not of Christmas, but of the day immediately after Christmas. Jesus came to set people free, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The fact that we've been boiled to death in the kettle like the frog here in America is no excuse. The fact that we've tolerated and encouraged so much garbage is no excuse. Even in this land of cultural depravity, Jesus Christ is still bringing people out of Egypt and keeping them out of Egypt. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Realize that oppression... You and I need to realize that oppression in this life is always a near threat, just like Herod was for Jesus. Coming out of Egypt is not the end of the conflict, but a confirmation that we are on the right journey. Now listen, I want to emphasize those two points for just a moment. Oppression. When the angel spoke to Joseph, he said, listen, I understand that that son, the king's son, is there. So even though one, one oppressor died, a new one's ri- And that's the way the devil is. You, you think, well, you know, it used to be I, I was really a, I was a fearful person. In, in my earlier life, I was just fearful. Or you might say I, I, I was an anxious person or I was an angry person or I was a greedy person. You might say whatever. But I'm going to tell you something. Just because Jesus gave you the victory over that doesn't mean you'll never have another fight. Because the devil's just always raising up new demons, isn't he? But here's the promise. The partner is still there in the life of Jesus. And God is speaking to the partner. God is anointing the partner. And the partner says, oh, the king's son is there in his place. We we can't go there. And then being warned again, he takes Jesus and Mary up north. And the peace of God comes. Hallelujah. There's a plan to stay out of Egypt. It's a new day. You'll face new demons. But God's plan, once enacted in your life to be out of Egypt, his plan will keep you from being overcome by Egypt again. Praise God. Brother Dave Hill and I were just talking the other day about a young person that we watched God do great things. And we talked the other day. Brother Dave showed me some pictures. Used to be you didn't always know where people were, you know, in their, in their spiritual life. But now we get a kind of an instant feedback. If, if it's a young person, anybody under my age, they're showing us their countenance online. They've got to have pictures on there. They can't live without putting pictures on. And so I said, how's he doing? And Dave held me up the phone. And I said, uh-oh, he, he's not out of Egypt yet we we got to stay in the fight with him. He's not out of Egypt yet. we got, we got to hang in there because you're his partner. And you're gonna, there's going to be a day come when he's knocking or he's broken down. He's outside your door weeping. There's a day coming because he's had a taste of what it is to be out of, out of Egypt part way. He's had a little glimpse of glory. And he knows there's power to come all the way out. But he didn't realize how deep this was ingrained in his being. He had no idea. Even though he was trying to come out of Egypt, Egypt didn't want to come out of him. And he didn't know that. But as long as you 
stay there as a partner, a day will come when God says, I want you out, all the way out. Not both arms and one leg, not both legs and one arm. I want you all the way out. And on that day, God will move heaven and earth to make sure that you come out. And when you do, he'll say, I got a plan for you not to go back. I have a plan for you not to go back. Literally, you may relocate. You, you may change friends. You will change friends. I guarantee you that you'll find friends, what you had before. The people who are keeping you in Egypt are not your friends. You can use that word all you want to, but you're lying. I'm not buying it, but you're lying to yourself, and you know you are. The Bible says about ungodly people, they are deceiving and being deceived. And Satan is also among them, deceiving but being deceived. It ain't happening. He's not overcoming. He's not going to take God off the throne. It's not his global government that's coming. He never is able to get it. But just a few moments after almost getting there, the king of glory appears. And binds him for a thousand years. Because there is a global government coming. There is a one world system forming right now. And I'm a part of it. I'm letting you in on, on, a, on a very secret um, conspiracy. Cons I'm, it's a theory. Based on God's word. Come on, bow your heads with me this morning. Father, we thank you for the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that is not limited to Christmas. Hallelujah. We thank you that in this day and time in which we live, that there is something that happened after Christmas, after Bethlehem, after the manger. There is a message for us, and I think we often overlook it. We forget it because we throw this in with the Christmas story. We don't understand the significance of it prophetically, biblically. Oh, thank you today, Lord, that we recognize there is a deliverance available for the people of God that Christmas says, I love you. And Egypt, God bringing his son out of Egypt says, I love you enough to bring you out. Hallelujah. Believers, you're talking to the Lord right now. Please, you're praying for souls that are on the line right now. You're praying and interceding. I'm not an intercessor, but some of you are, and you need to be praying right now that Jesus Christ will do great saving work. Some of you are entangled with gender identity confusion, and all it is is Egypt. Some of you are entangled in relationships you should have never been in, and you know it. You know where you crossed over into Egypt, you know it, but you're convinced there's no way out, you don't deserve to come out, and you might as well just pay the price and stay. Listen, you cannot earn salvation. You can't be sorry enough. You can't stay in Egypt so long. If you just stay there 20 years or 30 years, then God will have enough pity on you to bring you out. It does not work that way. And you know it. You don't understand the nature of the Father nor the Son. The nature is they love to bring us out. That's why he died on the cross. It's his good pleasure to liberate us. That's what he does. Now, is he worthy of all the credit, all the praise, all the worship, and all the glory for the rest of our lives and all eternity because of it? Yes, a thousand times yes. But if you think that you're going to stay there and impress God by enduring when in reality, deep in your heart, you know what it is. You just don't want to go through the trouble getting out. You enjoy being the victim much more than trying to come out of Egypt. But for you who are watching me right now, who are listening to this on the radio, you who are aware that you're in Egypt and you have a passion to come out no matter what. You don't care what stands in your way. You don't care how many giants the, the Lord has to slay on your behalf. You don't care what happens. You don't care what you lose. You're coming out of Egypt with not even the clothes on your back. If you've got that passion, I've got good news. Jesus is about to send you a partner and bring you out. I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, along with my brothers and sisters who are praying, I'm praying that you will bring men and women, young men, young women, teenagers, bring them out of Egypt now, out of addictions to heroin and pain pills, out of addictions to cocaine and alcohol, out of addictions to gambling and 
pornography. Bring your future sons and daughters, your entangled ones. And Lord, bring your sons and daughters out of Egypt. I love that the prophet said, My son, my son shall be brought out of Egypt. Thank you for loving people while we're in Egypt, Lord. You loved me while I was there. I was your son. Certainly wasn't a very good one. Didn't represent you very well. And I can honestly say there was nothing I did that brought me out, but everything you did. And I thank you for that today. Now I pray that those who are in Egypt who are hearing me would say, God, if he's telling the truth, if that preacher is telling me the truth, I want to come out of my Egypt. If that, if that pastor is, is my partner, I want to come out of Egypt. Jesus, if you are real, bring me out of Egypt. Now, right now, in his mighty name, I pray for men and women who want to come out. Father, bring them. Grab hold of them. Send your redemption to them like a great rope let down from heaven. And grab hold of them and begin to bring them out of their addiction, out of their stronghold, out of their fear, out of their self-destructive patterns. Bring them out. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Church, would you stand with me this morning, please? Would you stand with me all over this place? This may not, I, I don't know what you come here expecting on Sundays, and it may have been different than what you were expecting, but I'm going to tell you there was a fight for the last two days over this message. I know that you think sometimes when I say the problems with technology or even the enemy's attempt, but listen, I got news for you. I, what I went through physically this morning, got sick, um, what, what we have with technology here, because yesterday I had people calling me and texting me and saying, so-and-so is coming to church, so-and-so is going to be there, and I pray that Jesus does a work. There's a battle. People don't come out of Egypt without intentionality, without intensity, without a struggle. Satan doesn't want to let go of people. He likes having a, a big group of people in bondage. But I believe 2021 is the year when Cumberland begins to see people miraculously delivered, miraculously set free. Amen? I'm believing that you and I and others... Uh, we invite other churches to join us on this fast or any other kind of fast. Let's get together. Let's break strongholds. I was even praying yesterday, and I went online. I started looking for tents. I, I want to find a, a gospel tent, a crusade tent. And boy, as soon as it's like not 28 degrees out, just put a tent somewhere every month, have it somewhere else downtown, and just go preach like hell is hot, heaven's open to anybody who wants, and Jesus is here right now. Amen? Praise God. We're going to do it. We're, we're, God's going to raise up evangelists right here. And we're going to do it. Well, during this uh, time of worship, Brother Ricky will lead us in a song again. And, and in this time, I want you to take time there at your pew. Make, make an altar. If, you've, if you feel like you, you understand Egypt and you're not there, would you ask God if he would make you a partner for somebody? And he's not going to make you do things that you're not capable of doing, but that he would just use your gifts and your abilities, your knowledge of the Word. Pastor, I don't know but two or three verses, that he would use your knowledge of the Word. Joseph's just a young carpenter. But God used his gifts and the provision of others, the wise men, to do what he wanted to do. Would you pray and say, God, make me a partner for Cousin Louie. Make me a partner for Brother Billy Bob. Make me a partner. And I'll pray for them so that you can bring them out of Egypt. And you just make a, an altar there at your pew, a place of dedication. If you want to come to the altar, if you're on, on my right or my left, 
Uh, nobody will come and pray for you. You can be social distanced. If you want me to pray for you, I'll have my mask on. I'll spray my hands, and I will agree with you about anything this morning. If you're here and seeking healing or deliverance, whatever it might be, I'll pray with you. Thank you for getting out this morning in the midst of really, really cold air and being in the house of God. I hope you feel like it was worth it for you to be here today. There's so much more we want to do, but we just can't yet. But we're going to in 21. Amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord this morning before we get out of the house.